Uh, depending on where you went to middle school, I believe Mr. Lehman really liked router tables, and Miss Neal and Miss Bostrom, yeah. they did not use router tables as much. Mm -hmm. So some of you probably used these a bunch, and some of you didn't. And the answer is that all, <laughs> all routers are useful, and you can use them lots of different ways. I'm going to show you both ways and let you choose which, which way you want to go. Could you guys not stand on top of those, please? You're right. Can you not stand on a stool, please? All right, thank you. So half of you are going to be new to the router table, and half of you are going to be new to the handheld router, and it's all going to be good. Generally speaking, you use a handheld router for big things. Like on our cabinet that we're building, you're going to use the handheld router to route the edges of that. You're not going to take a full-size cabinet, throw it up on a router table, and try to use that way. But on our hat rack, a smaller piece, or our door, or our drawer front, you're going to use the router tables. It makes sense that the smaller objects go on the router tables, the bigger objects use the handheld router. Uh, number one, always be sure that the switch is in the off position before plugging in the router. Always be sure the switch is in the off position before plugging in the router. The on-off switch is right here. We have all except for one, and you probably never use this one. All of our routers are the black and deck, I'm sorry, the Porter Cable Model 1000 series routers, and they're all about the same. The only difference in some of our routers is how we loosen uh, the base of the router. Most of them are like this one that I have in my hand where this flips open and then we adjust the height of the cut by spinning this left or right. That's how most of them are. A couple of them have a hand screw that loosens and then we do the same thing. So they're almost all identical routers and that's very much a standard router. That's, the, that's been the design for probably 25 years and people like it and it works well so they don't change it. Uh, the next blank is pointing to router tables and router. I'm thinking you guys can figure out the difference there. Uh, number two, never turn on the router when the bit is touching the piece of wood. Just like with, just like with the miter saw, these bits are designed to cut going really fast. These are actually the fastest cutter, cutters in the shop. They go at about 20,000 RPMs. So that's what the router bits are set up to cut at, 20,000. They're not set up to cut at 100 when you first turn it on and it's touching the board. So you'll know when you turn it on, especially when you're using the flush trim router, which we'll get to in a couple weeks, if that's touching the board and you pull the trigger to turn it on, it's going to kind of throw it out of your hands a little bit. So make sure that it's up to full speed before engaging the piece of wood that you're cutting. I, I want to step back to the number one, this switch being off. It's really important that you check that this is off first because these routers have a ton of torque. They go from zero to those 20,000 RPMs almost instantly, and that creates a lot of torque. So we want to make sure that this is off, otherwise if the power is on and I plug it in, this thing's going to flip over because it's going to have so much power behind it. Now if this does start falling off the table, so let's say I check it, this happened once where the switch was actually bad, and even though it said it was off when we plugged it in, it turned on, and this thing twisted and started falling on the table, off the table. Should you try to catch it? No. No, just let it go. Even if this thing is not plugged in and it falls, just let it fall. It's okay if we break a bit. The bits are 25 bucks. Even if this thing is not on and you try to catch it, it's going to cut you. So please let it fall. You're not worth getting hurt for. I'm sorry. The router's not worth getting hurt for. That didn't sound very good. You're not worth getting hurt for. Uh, number four. When using the router to cut, go slow and steady. Slow and steady, just like the Taurus. Some people want to make this go super fast and let the router kind of get out of control. When the router gets out of control, it generally messes up your board. It takes too much off or it really tears instead of cuts, depending on how hard the project is that we're working on. What's number three? Ah, between cuts with the router, set the router on its side and turn off the power. Thank, Thank you. you. Number three, I have a terrible habit of leaving routers like this. We should leave them like that. Because now, if I accidentally turn this on or I plug it in, the power's on, it's probably not going to fall on the floor because we got these handles here. So if you can leave it on the side, that router's going to be a lot more stable. Uh, number five, never rest any part of the router against your body. I'll tell you why, as soon as people are done here. 
So, if you're holding the router next to your body and you turn it on, sometimes you're going to have floppy clothes on. Like, let's say you're wearing the hoodie because it's a cold day and it's winter. I don't want your shirt getting tangled up in the router bit. There's also on the back side, this is probably pretty rare, but there's a, a fan in here that when the router spins, the fan spins and it draws air in to cool down the motor. I don't want your shirt getting sucked up inside of that either. So just don't have this near you when you turn it on. Have it probably sitting on a table or away from you when you do fire it up so that your shirt's not getting tangled up uh, in the router bit. Number six, when using the router table, you can only feed the wood on the in-feed or left-hand side. And it probably will depend on the router table, but actually these router tables I've drawn arrows on, and the in-feed side is on the right-hand side, so you don't have to change this. It should just say the in-feed side. We remember the router table as your favorite band, one direction. We can only move the wood through the table in one direction. If you think back to that video that we saw, that kickback video, when that guy was cutting, he exaggerated a little bit for the video, but that router table that he was using, when he went with the grain or with the direction of travel, he kind of took the board and flopped it out of his hands. That won't happen if you go from right to left. So we go this way, the arrow that's kind of wearing out, I'll have to get a sharpie and redraw that arrow. But if we go from right to left, we have all the control because we're going the opposite direction that the router bit is spinning. Number seven, the most common shake sizes for the router are one quarter inch and one half inch. One quarter inch and one half inch. Here they are, one quarter inch diameter, one half inch diameter. These both work great. If I have the option, I usually go with the half inch diameter shank because it gives me a little bit more weight, which reduces vibration a little bit. However, they both work. If you use a router long enough that you actually break the shank off of it, congratulations, that's a long time to have a router bit. So both of these are gonna work great. These are usually about a dollar more than these and the average router bit is maybe $25, depending on the quality of the router bit. You can get them cheaper and you can get them more expensive. Number eight, clamp down small pieces that need to be cut with the router. You need to keep your hands three inches away from the cutter head. Chances are you're not going to have to clamp anything down because smaller pieces like your hat rack, you're just going to bring to the router table and move them through the router table. So most likely, you're not going to have to clamp anything down in this class because most of what you're going to use the handheld router on is significantly larger uh, than three inches. Uh, number nine, be sure that the shank of the router is at least a half of an inch inside the collet. This is a collet. It's the black thing that actually holds the router bit to the router. The shank of the router bit needs to be in at least a half of an inch. Now on some of these bigger ones, like this one, there's actually a line. It says minimum insertion, and it's got a line drawn right on there. So this one's probably even more than a half of an inch, it looks like. But we want to have at least a half of an inch in there, otherwise it's like snow cone in a baseball. That's what we called it when I was a kid. If you barely caught a baseball in your glove, just the web of it, we called that snow coning it. Who's it for? Oh, there she is. Do you want to go grab that? Lucky you. Uh, we don't want to just snow cone a router bit and have it come flying out at us. I don't think any of us want to try to catch that. The next three pictures are of most common things that we encounter here. The first picture is of this router bit, and this is called a roundover router bit. The most common router bit that we will use, or that you that is used in the United States. I can't speak for outside the U.S., but this is by far, probably 50% of router bits that get used are this one. And what this does is it takes a square edge on a board and it makes it round. So we'll do this on the top of your hat rack. We'll do this on the top of your counter, of your uh, cabinet top. We'll do this on the front of your door, the front of your drawer front, if you choose. This is what most people use as the round over. The middle thing is called the collet, C-O-L-L-E-T, the collet. This is what holds the router bit to the router. 
Then on the other side, this is actually not the right bit. Well, that other bit is called a cove, which between the cove and the roundover bit, they account for probably 60 to 70% of the router bits that are used uh, under normal wear and tear here in the US. So the cove and the roundover are the most common, and that's what we have set up at these router tables. This one is the roundover, and this one is the cove. You can decide which one you want to use on your project. It makes no difference to me. More people probably do the roundover, but the cove gets you just as many points. Uh, number 10 and 11 both have to do with the shaping. And we'll cover those when we start using the shapers to make our doors. That's not going to be for another five weeks or so. But number 10, I need you to know the answers to these two questions. Number 10, both hands are needed. Both hands need to be on the coping sled. Coping sled when using the cope cutting shaper. The coping sled. That is what that, that thing with the two black handles is a picture of a coping sled. The reason we have to use that is a shaper is like a router, but a, a shaper is much heavier duty. So this is about a one, a little over a one horsepower router. Those shapers are five horsepower. So the motors are about yay by yay. They spin really quick and they won't slow down for anything. You can put any part of wood in there, any piece of your body in there, and it's gonna just turn it into sawdust instantly. Super powerful and super strong. So instead of just holding the boards and running them through the shaper, we've got to use that thing called a scoping sled to help hold our board in place so it doesn't get sucked into the machine. And then number 11, keep hands three inches away from the wheels up on the table or the table and stick cutting shaper. Three inches away, that's that shaper over there. That one's got this thing called a power feeder on it. So we actually don't have to push anything through that one it grabs the board and feeds it through through for us. We'll talk about that one when we come time to building our doors. I'll show you exactly how it works. Uh, but for now, let's look at this, at this one. This is the cove cutter. And there's a couple things that you need to do. Number one, this fence should be adjusted so that it's covering up the bit whenever possible. Now, if you've got a hat rack that's got some funky curves in it, you may have to back this off so those curves can actually touch the router bit. If you don't, your, your curves won't be routed. Uh, if you're doing just straight routing, what I like to do is you'll notice on the top of every router bit is a bearing. Not every router bit, but the ones we're going to use. What this bearing prevents us is from taking too much off of our piece of wood. So this only cuts until the bearing hits the wood and then it stops. So your routes always look perfect. You're not having to uh, try to guess or stop and start in the right spot. Your routes always come out perfect. So to set up a straight piece, all I do is I, I touch the bearing with this piece of wood and I bring the fence up to it. Now when I run it through, it makes contact with the bearing and we're in good shape. It's nice because we've got this cover over the top of the bit, so it prevents our hands from getting down inside of it. Now again, if you've got an irregular shape that you're trying to route, you'll have to unscrew this and move the fence back just a little bit so you can get that in and taken care of. To use this now, remember I go from the right hand side of the table to the left hand side of the table, and this is my on off button right in the front. So again, if you have trouble, hit the off button. And you can see I have a nice looking cove there. You have complete control over the height of the router table. So, this often fills up with sawdust, so I like to get a key in there and get the sawdust out. This is going to raise the router bit up or down. This goes in here, and you can see I can turn it left or right. I would always run a scrap piece of wood through here, so there's almost always a scrap piece of wood in a garbage can. So you can make sure it's at the height that you like. Uh, the look will, stay, will change significantly based upon how tall or how high the router bit is up. Is that okay? All right. These should just live back there. They shouldn't be on the floor. Uh, and... We should be good to go. Any questions? Anything I went too quickly over? So we'll take this test tomorrow. Uh, for the rest of class today, uh, Peter's going to be